Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, welcome to Product Tank. Thank you very much for joining us. My name's James. I'm going to be your host for today, and uh, we're going to run through a fantastic session with some brilliant speakers all about remote working in a uh, world of product management. For those that don't know, Product Tank was started uh, above a pub in London uh, 10, 15 years ago now as a chance, as a way for people to talk about what product management is and what they were learning and what was working and what wasn't. A lot of that hasn't changed. This is still a space for people to come and uh, come and uh, let everyone know what um, what they're finding to be successful and what isn't in this new world that we live in. Uh, a few things have changed. We're now um, in 200 cities across the world and there's loads of different ways ways that you can get involved in the community. You can pop onto our YouTube channel to see all of the recordings of the different product tanks that we've had in the last uh, in the last month since we've been in the uh, pandemic. You can see the London um, the London sessions there. We've got everything from how to build product in an enterprise, building product strategy, how to grow from scale ups to uh, from startups to scale ups and beyond. There's some really great content there with some really fantastic speakers. Do go and check it out. If you also head to Mind the Product, um, you can find other ways to get involved. There's a really great Slack uh, community there, some really good content on the website, and the Product Experience podcast is giving you loads of insight into, uh, into how different people are tackling product management in the world that we now live in. There's also uh, a bunch of different ways you can get involved from a membership perspective, um, where you've got special content, everything from interviews with uh, product leaders, kind of AMA type um, comp, uh, sessions, and lots of uh, really specialist content, really well, really well produced. Do go and have a look and sign up if you think it could be uh, helpful. We're also uh, continuing to run some great product management uh, workshops. So these are all remote now, of course, and some of them are self-directed. Um, you can use them as and when you or your team need them. Some of them are you know, interactive workshops where we can do it with groups that, of people that know each other or lots of people that don't. So again, have a look, see what uh, might be helpful for you and your teams to uh, level up your product skills. Um, so on to tonight. Uh, today even. So um, if you want to get involved, if you want to ask a question, then please do go to slido.com and use the event code up here. You can drop a question in there. You can vote up or down other people's questions. We'll be doing, uh, we'll be asking questions of our panelists at the end once everyone's talked through um, what their, talked through their thoughts. Before we kick off though, we also thought we'd run a little poll. So obviously with this product tank all about remote working. We thought we'd uh, try and understand where everyone thinks they'll be um, based by the end of 2021. So do you think you'll be back in an office full time? Do you think you'll be 100% remote? Do you think you'll be somewhere in between? If you go and have a look there, then um, we will pop up the results in just a moment. That will be interesting to see for you and for hopefully our panelists. So, Everyone we've got talking today, we have, yeah, as I said, three awesome speakers. We've got uh, Rianne, who's joining us as uh, head of product at Wildbit. Rianne is um, joining us from Oregon, where it is about five in the morning. So he's already said he is definitely going to be holding a cup of coffee as he goes through his session. Uh, thank you for joining us, Rianne, especially at the time of day that it is over there. Uh, Ingrid is joining us from Norway, in fact, um, where she is co-founder and chief product and technology officer at Whereby. She's gonna be talking to us all about how her and her team, her teams and her clients uh, collaborate remotely. And then we're gonna be joined by Simon, who is the chief executive officer at the Mental Health and First Aid um, organization here in England. And he's gonna to talk to us about what we can do to make sure that we're focusing on our mental health and the resilience of our teams in this new environment that we're working in. So hopefully it should be a really great session. As I say, do ask your questions on Slido. You can pop them in the comments on YouTube if you like. Um, we'll try and pick some questions and uh, give you some answers at the end after everybody's spoken. So if we can have a little look at the results of that poll, how are we looking? Where does everyone think they're gonna be working by the end of 2021? So a bit of a hybrid model for most, right? Okay, that's good to see. Only 8% think they're going back to the office full time. There you go. Right, so hopefully this is going to be beneficial no matter where you end up. Um, but right, first off, I'm going to hand over to Rianne 
and uh, who's going to take us through some of his thoughts on the biggest strategic opportunities and challenges that remote working gives us for product management teams. Rian, over to you, mate. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, James. Good morning. Can you just confirm? I can see you all. So is everything working? Yeah, all's good, mate. We can see you. All right. Awesome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Or as you probably heard, good morning. It's five o'clock here. Um, I was telling James, it's kind of like traveling uh, to London because I feel pretty jet lagged. So it's it's almost as if I flew over there and I'm with you. So uh, the chances of my kids budging in are also a little bit lower this morning uh, due to the time. So uh, uh, I'm happy to join join you all. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our perspective at Wildbit on product management for remote teams. Um, and to do that, I wanted to give you just a little bit of background about who we are, who Wildbit is. Uh, Wildbit is a 30-person uh, company. Uh, we've been around for 20 years. Uh, we are um, bootstrapped, and so no outside funding. We're profitable. We're about, like I said, 30 people. Um, we make tools for developers mainly. Uh, we currently have four products. Uh, Postmark is uh, transactional email, and then uh, some other tools that you may or may not have heard about. Definitely check out People First Jobs. It's a, it's a free job board that we recently started uh, for companies who put people first, um, which is a, a big part of how we work and operate. We are, uh, we've been in business for 20 years, like I said. Uh, we have about 100,000, over 100,000 customers. And uh, we have 32, I think this slide is outdated, 32, 32 people in the company. And here's the interesting thing. So Wildbit, uh, like I said, turned 20 last year, and we have always been remote. We've always been a remote first company. The first developer uh, was in Croatia, I believe. Um, so uh, we've, we have, um, over the past few years, had a, had a small office in Philadelphia where about less than 10 people live um, but obviously during this time even even they are are not in the office right now so we've been doing remote for a very very long time but even for us when things changed at the beginning of or the middle of last year uh, we had some struggles too because it's one thing to work remotely uh, it's another to work remotely when you're also homeschooling and uh, worrying about uh, the end of the world, so to speak. So uh, we, even though we came at it with a lot of um, tools and, and ways of working already in place, uh, it was still an issue for us. We were still struggling a little bit to, to get used to it and to figure it out. So it's about those things that I, that I wanted to chat about a little today. We all know the challenges of remote work. We all know um, the uh, the biggest complaints that people have about remote work. The, the famous Steve Jobs quote about lack of serendipity uh, when you're not remote working. You still have a lot of leaders, particularly in the product community, saying no, co-located co teams are the way to go. Um, because a lot of those decisions have to happen in real time. All those things may be true. But what I found is we don't often consider the opportunities of remote work enough. Yes, there are lots of challenges to it, but there are also some things that remote work is just naturally better at. And the goal, I believe, for good uh, remote work setup, particularly product management, is to downplay those challenges and actually play up the opportunities. Um, lean into those opportunities. And those are the things we're going to talk about today. The biggest thing is this. Remote work makes it much easier to develop a rhythm of collaboration and focus time for a team. Uh, if you haven't read uh, Deep Work, um, it's uh, it's one of the books that our, that, that our team sends to every new employee who joins, who joins Wildbit. Um, we, get, we, we have to read Deep Work before we start working. Uh, deep work makes the point that we each of us has about four hours of focused work in us uh, per day, and that's it. The thing is, if you're a product manager, like most of you probably are, many of you probably don't have four hours uh, of focused work a day because of meetings and, and being pulled in a bunch of different directions. Now, the thing that's great about remote work is that it makes it easier to have that focus time and come back up for air, so to speak, for, for collaboration. As an example, here's just 
we don't always work like this, but here's how I kind of look at it and how we often uh, work through projects. We have private work, which is deep work, um, and public work, which is the, the, the get feedback. And it, it's almost this wave of, of working privately, getting your work done in a focused way and coming up for air, sharing with the team, getting feedback and going back down. So for example, you might have a really small team working on problem definitions and initial concept, concepts. Then you might come up for air and do a call and get feedback on that. The designer goes back in, into a period of deep work, does some designs and comes back up for air and do, an, do another video call. And on and on it goes uh, until, until the project is, is done. But the main thing here is because of how remote work is set up, it's much easier to find the time and to, to really focus on that private deep work because it's so much easier to shut down distractions as a remote worker. The deep work part of that cycle can dramatically increase both the speed and quality of the work that gets done. And that, I don't know if that is a controversial statement. I will say that we at Wildbird have, have proven that. We have, recent, not recently, but two and a half years ago, moved to 32-hour work weeks uh, where we work Monday through Thursday, eight hours a day. Um, and we, ha because that we have really started focusing on this part, the fact that what can we get rid of during the day that is not part of deep work, that is not that is too much of a distraction? How can we lean in on the opportunities? And what we found is we don't need then 40 or more hours a week to get our work done. Our, uh, our, the quality of our work has not suffered um, and neither has our, uh, um, our ability to ship in time. So we are able to do this because of how easy it is to, to shut down as a remote worker. But let's go into that. I wanted to talk uh, this morning, this afternoon, I need to stop saying this morning, about uh, just give you five principles that we have found over time on how to work better remotely. The first and most important one, and I think uh, you're going to hear this again <laughs> later today uh, in one of the other talks, is don't try to recreate the office experience. This really is the biggest mistake I see uh, that people make when they go remotely, is they try to create virtual water coolers and uh, uh, try to re recreate all the synchronous meetings they used to have, find a way to do it. I even recently read about this new startup that creates virtual uh, offices um, and each person gets an avatar. So if you want to talk to someone, you move your avatar over to them and then they know you're there and then you talk to them. And I'm just really confused by that. I think it is, um, as we would say in the product management world, the wrong solution to a real problem. Don't try to recreate the office experience. Instead, optimize for asynchronous communication and fully embrace that as the primary way of working, not an inferior substitute. And I put that part in brackets in particular because whenever I talk to people about asynchronous communication, they inevitably say, yeah, we do that. You know, we use Google Docs, we use paper docs, but I really find that it doesn't, it's, it's, we still need a meeting to sort things out or we we still we still can't get to the end of of a project like that and again i think that that is this blockage in our brains are where we think that it is inferior we think that we're somehow missing something and therefore um we we can't do the work that we need to do but if you really optimize for that and i'll talk more about that later on how to do that in terms of the tools in terms of the trust you give the team and in terms of how you think about the cycle of deep work versus public work, you can do absolutely everything asynchronously. But this leads into the second principle, which is default trust. Um, there is much more need for trust in a remote team, uh, particularly if you're going to, to default to, or if you're going to focus on asynchronous communication. The core principle here is this, when people have the freedom to work when they're feeling their best, they do their best work and they enjoy the work more. Again, back to the opportunities of remote work. If you are sharing uh, designs in a way that uh, give people an opportunity to give feedback on those designs, 
at their own time when they're feeling their best. For some people, it might be 5 a.m. in the morning. For others, it might be 9 p.m. But if you give people that freedom, they are going to do their best work. But that only happens when you trust them. And this is, again, such a great thing about remote work and asynchronous communication is you can go and say, hey, we, we need to make this decision by end of day Thursday, but everyone can fit that into their own cycle of private and public work when they want to give feedback on those things. But the trust is so important. Uh, our CEO tells a story about when when everyone first started going remote. She she uh, uh, last year she got a lot of calls from people asking for advice, and one of the biggest questions she got was, "Well, what software do you use to make sure people are paying attention on Zoom, or what, what software are you using to make sure people aren't?" on Facebook all day. And it was a question that just didn't compute. And I think her answer was, well, uh, just make sure your meetings are useful and interesting and treat your people like adults. Uh, there shouldn't be a need for making sure people are focused on their Zoom call. All you have to do is make sure that you have a meeting that is useful to people and is actually helping them. And the same way uh, with with the trust around asynchronous work, it is not necessary for someone to give feedback at 10 a.m. in the morning just after something was shared. What is important is that they are doing that when they are have that time set aside to do that work. And that is just such a core part of, of uh, being good at remote work is the, the trust and the asynchronous nature of it. And again, the, this is a big part of this, is you have to love your tools. And I know we love talking about tools as product managers, but it is such an important thing. If you, if everyone hates the tools that you use, the work will find a way to not get done. But the problem is you'll end up blaming remote culture and you'll want to move everyone on site, um, which when that isn't the problem, remote culture is not the problem when crappy tools are the problem. Um, so if your team loves Jira, great. If your team would rather prefer to use Trello, think about that. Because when with asynchronous communication, the tool is the way to get that work done. And if people don't like that, similar to if they don't like an office, you're going to change the way the office is organized the same way. This is your office. The tools where you live is your office. Um, and it's also really important to set some boundaries around how those tools are being used. I think Slack is a big one. We, we at Wildbird do, do not have very specific rules around Slack. Uh, we don't make any decisions in Slack. We don't require someone to get up in the morning and read through an entire conversation. That should be ephemeral. I know that the, I saw a tweet yesterday of someone saying well, the, the free version of Slack gets rid of your, like when you run out of space, it gets rid of your messages. And that should actually be a paid feature um, because the messages in Slack is not meant to be the decisions that you're making over time. Those are for, for the odd real-time organization or cat meme. Uh, but if we make a decision, it's going to happen somewhere more permanent. Um, and so setting those boundaries around your tools uh, are really important. In a remote culture in particular, uh, I think there's a shift happening in product management where we need to embrace bottom-up planning. Um, and I say this carefully because I know most organizations work with top uh, tops down planning where the executive team or user product manager decide what work gets done and then the, how the teams go and execute on that work. But I think, again, that is not uh, leading into the opportunities that remote work give us. Your job as product manager is way more traffic controller than it is decider in a remote environment. How we do planning is quite different. We, uh, we set the strategic context we, uh, about where, what, where we want to go this year and where we are as a company. But the teams decide, we, we figure out what problems, what the main problems are we're going to try to solve this year. But our individual teams are the ones who decides, who decide how that gets implemented and how that work gets done. Someone is accountable for that work within that team. Very often not the product manager, whoever is the right person for that. And our role as leads team and our role, role as, as product managers are to facilitate that. Because then once you get this 
uh, small teams that work in autonomous units, um, you're able to embrace this bottom-up planning where the team takes ownership of their work, works together. And again, it's so much easier in a re remote environment because of the way that cycle can work. There's a great book called Team Topologies, which I think is, is being talked about a lot right now. Uh, it's 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 dense and heavy, <laughs> uh, so if you if you buy it and read it, expect textbook, not uh, not fluffy business book. But one of the biggest uh, learnings for me out of that book was to see the team as the smallest unit of organization in a business, not the individual. Your team is the smallest unit of organization, and as soon as you start thinking about that all the stuff starts to fall into place around embracing bottom-up planning, what it means for your role as product manager, where you help. Um, and in our new remote culture, this gets more and more important, where we are pushing the planning to the individual teams that have full ownership of that. And then once you work in that cycle of deep work and public work, um, you'll see that you start to move faster and the quality of the work actually increases and your role becomes more strategic. The, what's the biggest complaint usually from product managers is I'm too in the weeds, I can't, don't have time for strategic thinker, thinking. Well, here's a way to do it. Um, and the, uh, the remote culture that we have facilitates that. The last thing I wanted to bring up is just to say that, yes, in-person time is still important, but I don't think it is important for the reasons that we've always thought about. Um, in-person time is extremely important for remote teams, but you don't need it every day, and the reason you need it is not to get more work done. The reason in-person time is, is important is for those relationship building. When I uh, went back when we still traveled, when I go, went and visited the team, Yes, we did some work and we did meetings, but none of those meetings couldn't have been done uh, online with the tools we have. It was the discussions afterward. It was the dinners. It was getting to know people as people. Um, that's the really important part. So I wanted to put this principle here that in-person time is important, but to also shift our our thinking a little bit and saying not so that we can not be to, to fill up any gaps or deficiencies that remote work has, but because in the end, product management is still a relational job above anything else. So if there is a way for us to get this time with our teams, this non-work time with our teams now while we can travel, that is what's important. Um, so that when we get to know people, um, we can keep those relationships going. So um, those are the things I wanted to share this morning or this afternoon with you around a little bit about how we work at Wildbit, how we shifted um, to shorter work weeks as well as bottom-up planning um, because of the, the strengths that, that are given or the strengths that um, remote work can give us. And I think I'm going to stop sharing and then I believe there's, there might be a question. To Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rian. That was wicked. That, uh, love, the, uh, love the idea of not copying over just what you're doing in, a, in the real world into a remote setting makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, nice to give Slack a free free idea for their roadmap as well. I'm sure they need it. <laughs> <laughs> right, brilliant, thanks. We'll have you back on for questions in a little bit. So um, yeah, great. So next up, we've got Ingrid, who's uh, joining us, as I say, from Norway and Werby. Ingrid, is it Werby or Whereby? I'm, I'm uh, whereby. Whereby, <laughs> awesome, thank you. Well, I've learned something already. Um, brilliant, so Ingrid, thanks very much, over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks, Ryan. I think that was a great warm up. Um, and I can definitely uh, underline the importance of some of these principles. Um, and so I will be talking a little bit more about how to make remote collaboration work on a day to day basis and have tried to make it quite actionable with some tips that all of you can maybe go home and try out tomorrow. So why can I talk about this? Our product, Whereby, is a video conferencing tool, and uh, we are trying to bring human centricity into the video conferencing space, which I think is sorely lacking. And uh, our team is uh, now fully remote, and we have um, grown the team a lot over this year. We were 25, I think, in February last year, and now we just passed 80. So this year, we have been onboarding and hiring more than 40 new team members fully remotely never met them in person. And uh, so far, I think it's going great. 
uh, and I will try to share some of the learnings both from our own team and also some of our customers who are doing uh, quite cool things in terms of exploring ways of working remotely. So I think one of the biggest issues that we kind of see broadly in the market now, and especially after a year of lockdown with maybe another couple of months coming up is uh, Zoom fatigue or video fatigue and people kind of getting depressed from working from home or burned out um, and so on. And we are kind of discussing and thinking a lot around why does this happen? And why do we kind of feel tired after a work day? I think often it's because we have these back-to-back -back meetings all day and there's no room to kind of breathe or think in between them. And to <laughs> highlight what Ryan also mentioned, I think a big mistake that a lot of companies make is they just replicate the behavior that they had in the office and have all the same meetings, um, call a meeting uh, if they need to get some work done or, or discuss something. and don't fully embrace the new tools that remote working companies have been using for some time. And it's a big shift and it takes time, but I think it's really important to start exploring this because as the survey showed as well, I think a lot of people are gonna end up in, in a remote situation or a hybrid situation, and then you will need these tools. So I think when you just replicate that in-office behavior, the result can often be too many meetings and they're often ill-prepared or unproductive with too many people in them. And I think that again comes from the fact that we don't have enough time to prepare or really think through what do we need to do here? Uh, what's the agenda? What do I need the decision on? And prepare the materials that people need to make that decision. And that comes from not having enough focus time or time for deep work. So that's uh, a big challenge that we have um, started addressing in our own company at the, the exec level. And one thing that we discovered is uh, an amazing tool called Clockwise. It's a new calendar uh, extension app that you can basically plug into your calendar and it will automatically shift some of your less important meetings like internal one-on-ones around to give you these blocks of two, three hour focus time. Um, and kind of optimize that for you. It's not always easy to keep them. So it does require some effort, but I think um, in my own experience, experience, the result has been a lot uh, less stress in terms of having to catch up on all of the things that need doing in between the meetings. And also, as Ryan said, I think the key is really to combine asynchronous and synchronous communication in a, in a good way. We are obviously selling the synchronous communication, but that doesn't mean that we want to push people to have more and longer meetings um, uh, even so. So I think the async part is really important uh, for a remote team to put everyone's ideas down on paper, uh, also to present complex ideas, arguments and logical reasoning, and kind of have a document where things can live through multiple iterations and also make it easier to communicate across time zones. So finding a good way to combine these. And I have an example that's coming up as well. Another thing that we are using a lot is um, async video updates. So especially when scaling the company, this has been really useful because it's really hard to get everyone in a meeting at the same time. So instead, for things that um, need announcement or need explaining to people, we make these videos that we can then share in our wiki, in Slack, or um, send directly to people if we don't have time to set up a meeting with them. And then they can kind of feedback on that later. And uh, as Ryan mentioned, I can definitely vouch for um, loving your tools. So I think having a good solution for working asynchronously on docs is, is really key. And there are multiple solutions for this. We now use Notion and are pretty happy with that. There's also Confluence um, and others, but I think it's uh, having the ability to kind of edit it in real time with multiple people, adding comments and having good sharing settings. So you can decide what's shared with the entire company versus individuals versus the management team and so on. Is, um, is really important to scale your team. 
So as an example of how we are working with this, uh, we had a project recently where we needed to get something done quite quickly in a week or two. So we had a PM take lead on starting a wiki page and gathering IDs from everyone in the task force. And within one to two days, that list had grown quite long. And then the PM went through and kind of sorted things by theme and um, then circled back to the team to ask for their comments and votes on what they think should be prioritized and was most urgent. Then the PM kind of processed that and sorted it down to a short list of uh, activities that he was recommending. And then we could have a 30 minute meeting just to confirm and align everyone around those priorities and then assign responsibilities for actually doing it. So I think that was a much better process than just like trying to cram everyone into a one and a half hour meeting and trying to do all of this in one session. And then um, in combination with this, I think it's uh, important to have a very low threshold just to jump on video. If you need to clarify something or just need to discuss something, if you're feeling in the mood for that and having a good way to do that spontaneously um, is, is really important and something that we encourage in our own product. You shouldn't have to book a meeting to start talking on video. So here's a video of our designers and a developer who are uh, working on something in Figma together. And um, I think this allowed them to get to the final result much quicker than if they had done everything async. And then, um, one use case that has been notoriously hard to solve remotely is this creative collaboration and workshops. So I think there are some amazing tools out here. Miro is one, um, mural.co is another one. And uh, here you can actually structure a lot of the work that you want people to contribute to in advance by putting in images, sketches, uh, questions that you want people to answer um, in these sections. And then in the session, you actually guide people through them and everyone can collaborate, uh, contribute on each of the points. And they even have this uh, really neat voting feature where people can kind of add their votes. And so you can try to reach consensus at the end of the session. And we are using this for everything from kind of technical architecture drawings to privacy, legal um, processes and product user journeys um, and OKRs. I think for OKRs, we had a big session in Q4 where all of the team leads were kind of adding um, the areas that they wanted to work on. And then we tried to condense it down to align what was uh, common themes. Here we have uh, an example also of one of our customers, a startup called Place in Norway, working with the real estate sector, which is quite a conservative sector. And one of their problems was now during the pandemic, how can we really collaborate and get feedback, feedback from our pilot customers on the product that we're building? So um, they were really happy with using Miro inside Whereby. So they were just sending out the Whereby link to people and the clients didn't have to kind of learn a new tool or anything, but they could take them through uh, the session, control the experience and, and get everyone's feedback and sort the feedback in the session. Then I think there's also, sometimes you need the traditional meetings and uh, then it's about making sure that they're well prepared. So here are some tips from also one of our customers, which is Halon, a company that delivers an email service and they're working across the US, UK, Sweden and Germany. And they really iterate kind of uh, preparation, send out pre-reading materials and maybe also specify pre-reading time, how long people should budget on preparing and then have a clear leader who can make sure to engage everyone, especially kind of more introverted people who are maybe a bit afraid of uh, raising their hand or jumping in. And then start the meeting by reiterating what you want to get out of it. And then ideally take notes or document things so that everyone can see it or even contribute to it themselves. Um, and don't make too long meetings. Um, and I think here a lot of calendar solutions are not good because they default to half an hour or one hour meetings. So um, try to aim for 45 or 50 minutes instead, or make sure to take breaks if you need to go longer. 
And then this was a really cool thing. I think uh, if you're running Scrum or, or running a dev team that requires estimation, uh, a tip from another one of our customers was to, they made everyone install this uh, Scrum Places app on their phone. And then in the prioritization meeting, everyone would just kind of pick their uh, estimation and show it on the screen. And then they would discuss based on discrepancies and why people thought differently and so on. And then uh, also coming back to Ryan's point about trust, I think a big opportunity is uh, to visualize work more and also progress. And then it comes back to the tools you use and how you uh, integrate them bet between each other. Because a lot of the tool often happens out in uh, specific coding tools or design tools. And as a PM, you kind of deal with the maybe the task management uh, tool. So here's a really cool Norwegian startup that just got into Y Combinator, KiteMaker, and they are trying to make it easier to bring all of these tools together and for you as a PM to see um, or have access to all of the resources related to a task immediately and make it really seamless. But I know Jira also offers a lot of kind of integrations and Trello. Um, there's a lot you can do with automations to make, to eliminate the manual work of kind of moving cards or, or updating. So overall, one of the biggest um, organizational principles that we use or build our company on is making our teams tech enabled. And that means using all opportunities to make seamless processes where we don't need to do manual work to, um, to update things or, or so on or remind us. So we have set up our Slack to have a lot of reminders uh, with links so it's easy to fill out what you need or also updates from GitHub and other tools that our teams uh, want to pay close attention to. And I think this allows you to really also free up time to do to focus on problem solving, creative work, uh, people management, and, uh, and add a lot more value in that way. So to wrap up, I wanted to add a small piece of advice from someone who has been growing a team remotely now. And especially if you're a have people from different cultures and countries, when you kind of rely on async communication in, in Slack or chat, it's very easy to interpret something in the wrong way. Um, and one of the key principles that we tell people who come into our team is always assume best intentions. Don't kind of read negative stuff into something because it may not be intended that way or ask a question um, before you go down that route. So. I think that's it's just really important to keep a very respectful and friendly culture and um, have communication flowing between people in the team and also build out those personal relationships. There are actually some um, ways to do that digitally as well. We have something called Donut, which integrates into our Slack and then sets up random coffee chats between people in the company. So that's a great way to get to know people and maintain those relationships as well. So that's it. Um, have listed some of the tools that I mentioned here. Also, we at Whereby are hiring quite a few PMs. So if you're interested, our jobs are out on Mind the Product. Uh, amazing. Thank you so much, Ingrid. That was really, really interesting. You said super practical so that we can uh, all try stuff right away. I'm definitely going to have a look at Donut, Donut for Slack. Donut, yeah. Oh, no, that sounds wicked. I've been trying to do that for years. That's awesome. Um, it must have been an interesting experience growing a company remotely as well. Um, I, maybe I wonder if we'll get a couple of questions about that um, and we can touch on that in a minute. Lovely. Thanks again, Ingrid. That's great. We'll come back for questions uh, in a mo. So uh, finally up, we have Simon. Hi there, Simon. How are you doing? Hello. Good. So Simon uh, joined us from down. Are you still down, uh, down southwest England? I am Cornwall, yeah. Well, lovely stuff. Um, so Simon joins us from MHFA England. He'll tell you a little bit more about who they are and what they do, I'm sure. Um, but he's going to help ex uh, give us some insight into how we can look after ourselves and our teams in this world of remote working that we're now in. So Simon, over to you. Great. Thank you um, very much. And thank you for inviting me to speak. And apologies that I'm sat in a scarf here because Cornwall isn't very warm and I'm in a conservatory. So. Um, uh, but 
I'm going to just talk a bit today about um, keeping well, keeping motivated and performing. I'm the Chief Exec of Mental Health First Aid England, um, which is a social enterprise uh, whose mission uh, is to train one in 10 of the adult population in mental health skills, knowledge and understanding. And one in 10, because we believe that will create the culture change, which means that these conversations are usual, that people feel confident talking about mental health, they understand that it's not something to be frightened of, it's not something to be stigmatised, that we all have mental health um, and that people know how to access help um, and support. Um, I guess in terms of uh, just sort of the heading around keeping well, keeping motivated and, and performing, I'll come back to that in a bit, but sometimes uh, people, um, I think, assume that you're either mentally well and performing or you're not well and not performing, but they're feels increasingly as we move through this middle bit that actually um, thinking about how we are motivated as well as mentally healthy and therefore driving and focusing on the right things is really um, important. So I guess just as background around mental um, health, it's worth acknowledging that uh, however privileged or difficult it's been, the last 10 months has been tough uh, for everybody. There's been major changes um, in the way that we um, uh, uh, live our lives um, and made changes in the way that we work and for lots of people made changes in what they're working on as well. Um, for some colleagues in, in some organisations been incredibly tough for a range of reasons that might be crowded households, it might be um, difficult relationships, abusive within relationships so whilst there's a level of toughness for everybody there may be uh, you know, whether it's health, whether it's uh, abuse, whether it's about housing, um, really really difficult um, for some um, and we talk a lot at Mental Health First Aid England about bringing your whole self to work. Um, and of course, that's never been more in the spotlight because literally um, right now you can see into uh, my parents' conservatory because that's where I'm sat. You know, you might well hear the dog barking when uh, uh, the postie or Amazon or whatever um, arrives and for many people have had children, etc. So that whole context of, of bringing a whole self to work has never been more real. And actually, uh, that hasn't always been easy for people, but it has meant that there is no way that we can ignore uh, uh, that side of, of ourselves and, and working, um, uh, that we are not a work person and a home person, that we are one. So there's a, a sense of um, only by talking about mental health, only by having these sorts of conversations, both sort of across industries but also in organisations that can face into what's essentially stark realities of this going on for longer than expected um, there will inevitably perhaps be some less connectedness across um, organisations however that looks and manifests itself although of course different uh, uh, groups will, that will experience that differently there are restrictions certainly um, in the UK and lots of countries of another, um, of another lockdown and lots of people talking about how this one is harder and actually probably this one isn't harder but it's got the cumulative impact of of the other two or however many um got and then there'll be loads of changes in how we're doing things and yeah, you know, all organizations are changing whether that's because of growth whether that's because of needing to pivot or whether that's because of reduction so there's a huge amount of change to keep having to deal with as well and then <clears throat> we at mental health first aid england uh started thinking um, about keeping well um, and delivering uh, uh, because what people were saying as you would expect a mental health organization we talk about this um, a lot but actually we talk a lot about keeping well and, and about mental well-being developing routines you know switching off from work but at the same time it can feel like there's an enormous pressure to deliver and that that can sometimes bring those two things into tension but of course you know motivation can can be that sort of bridge um, across those two because if we know that the pressure is short term um, we know that there's an ending goal we know that the goal is clear um, we know that we might be putting the extra piece in but there will be an outcome there'll be some let up that we can find ways to actually hold those two things together and make sure that mental health drives um, our, our, our performance and work uh, is a positive impact on our mental well-being so finding those ways to maintain motivation is important um, but as leaders, we need to ensure that there's an ongoing conversation about um, well-being, motivation, delivery. But it isn't possible to prescribe uh, uh, exactly what should happen. But there are some guiding principles. 
Um, and then what lots of people have said in lots of different organisations, and this may or may not be true for yours, is that there are um, there may be activities that happened at the beginning of, of this change, the way of working, that could be reinstated because um, you know some things which started with sort of uh, uh, in earnest at the beginning and worked through the summer may have dropped off because people uh, just got used to the difference in the way that they're working. So at Mental Health uh, First Aid England, um, we did some uh, specific uh, uh, activity which was around supporting your mental health um, uh, whilst working from home. Um, and really that started with recognising that uh, you need to create routines. We need to uh, create routines which mean that um, we are um, enabling our brain to switch into work and switch out of work so that everything um, doesn't feel like uh, your ha it's happening in your home. Um, and <clears throat> what we mean, you know, some of the difficult things uh, that people have to do, difficult conversations, uh, whether yeah, there may be redundancies or job role changes, ordinarily you would do them outside of your home, but actually you're then trying, you're having to do some of those things in your home and there isn't that separation. So how do you create routines, whether that's you know, um, going around the block before you start work, packing up uh, when you finish work, um, making sure that the, you, you switch rooms if you have the luxury of being able to do that. So really trying to find ways to create some routines, to create some workspace, and also to keep active um, within um, that process. So um, you know, if you think about an average day where you were going into an office, there might be a commute or a journey or a bike ride, or um, or they'll be moving in between meetings so that you um, you manage to get some, some activity through the day. And our brains benefit from that. So how do you try and make sure that you keep some activity um, through the day um, as well? We talked about um, my whole heart uh, through December because that was very much around um, connectedness. What people were telling us in the organisation was that uh, that there was felt as though you know, worked incredibly hard. There was connections across the team, um, but actually that feeling of connectedness across the organisation um, needed to be um, a really important part uh, of what uh, they did. Um, and one of the things which we also found at the end of the year was really about that disconnecting being as important as connecting. Many of you will remember when it first started, and of course, um, lots of you working within tech anyway, um, that sort of sense of connecting. But for those of us who were new to um, a Zoom, new to being uh, on StreamYard or whatever, um, that, that sort of view that you had to stay connected very quickly became clear that we needed to disconnect as much as we needed to connect as well. So we, in terms of trying to help people to think about uh, how uh, that happened, um, we identified some underpinning um, principles, um, which were really that we all have the personal responsibility to use the flexibility and opportunities available, and while all the time thinking about ourselves, our team, and the organization's needs together. So not one um, at the expense um, of others, whether that's about time zones, whether that's about childcare, whether that's about uh, meeting spaces, etc. Just trying to make sure that we use that flexibility to protect our well-being, but also think about the team at the same time. So that real sense of needing to look out for each other um, and use empathy, emotional skills, understanding to care for ourselves and others. And I think you know, what we saw last year was um, a lot of people recognising that things were difficult, so using some of the meeting time at the beginning to check in with each other um, and, and actually may, seeing that as part of the work, making sure that we connect and may have those relationships um, and take the time, um, use and create opportunities to stay connected as well. So really thinking about it in the formal meeting spaces, but also trying to find ways um, to keep those relationships working as well. We know that talking is important. We know that checking in with each other and asking for support and help um, is important. But one of the things which uh, uh, lots of people and, and all the evidence shows is that when you need help most is often when you don't feel able to ask for it. So as, as all of us, it's our responsibility to be asking if people need help um, and asking if people need support rather than waiting necessarily for people um, to be uh, asking when they need it most. And that well-being is everyone's business, that we all have a responsibility to help each other. It's not just a leadership issue. Um, sometimes people will be saying, well, what's management doing? What are the leaders doing? And of course, it is a leadership issue, but it is also um, an issue for all of us. 
And of course, then the conversations are the work. Yeah, there isn't any magic bullet um, to this, but just having conversations about well-being, building them into every uh, uh, part of the organisation um, is critical to destigmatizing and making people feel able to talk. So just some areas for, um, for you to think about um, in relation to your, your own um, uh, work. And some of these will be um, granny um, sucking eggs and feel like they're HR, but are really critical to the um, uh, sort of well-being of teams. So the first thing um, that uh, people would often talk about is, do, do we have clarity about the expectations on working from home? You know, often um, organisations are saying, well, we're not sure what's going to happen next month. We're not sure what's going to happen the month after. But actually for people, for individuals, for us, it's, it's useful to know what's going to happen for at least the next three to six months so that we can build um, our understanding about what we need to do um, in response to that, where it's always, um, oh, and even if you, know, you think the office may open, I notice yeah, only 8% of people said we go fully back to the office, but even if the office, our office was to open next month, depending on what happened with the restrictions, we've been really clear with people that um, there is no expectation that anybody um, would be needing to go back into the office um, for at least another three months, so that people are clear about uh, what's expected, talked before about flexible working and um, are we taking responsibility for maximizing the flexibility within the context of our job roles um we at mhfa england got absolutely overwhelmed by meetings um, uh, at the beginning it felt like more came in rather than and less so we very quickly um, made a rule that half hour meetings needed to be 25 minutes maximum and 15 hour meetings became 50 minute meetings and if you think about six one-hour meetings in a day, um, reducing that to six 50-minute meetings, um, that gives you an hour back, whether that's to move, whether it's to go to the bathroom to get something to eat. It gives you know, that space um, within it. Similarly, the booking out non-meeting time in the diary every day and looking at where there are times in the week that can be blocked out as no meeting time. So we did that on Friday afternoons from three o'clock so that you didn't have that sort of race to finish things, which sometimes happens on a Friday evening, and not having the office um, to move out of, meant that some people say it really did uh, feel like it just bled into the weekend. So we, we created that space for meetings to be blocked out. And then what we know about you know, moving, what I said earlier about being active, you, can you do meetings while you're walking? Yes, there will be times where you need to see slides. Yes, there will be times where you need to be sat looking at each other. But you know, the phone um, is still um, a useful tool. So can we do that to create that opportunity for our body um, and mind to synchronize? Then around lunch breaks, we know that lots of people don't step away from the computer or the evidence shows that we need to. Um, and given that we also know about um, relationships, um, you know, can that time be used to, to meet up uh, uh, with colleagues, to walk and talk, have sandwiches together or whatever? So really trying to actively ask people to uh, uh, connect with people across the organisation. Coffee breaks, I think we should all use donut. Um, that's a, a great thing to be um, checking out. But that sense of, I, I recognise that we can't recreate the office, but we do need to be conscious about what did the office space bring to the culture that's being lost. And, and for lots of organisations, that's the cross-organisational relationship. So how do you bring those and make those happen in the new environment and, and try to create that. And then holidays, um, almost every organisation, um, I think, has, has had an issue this year with people not wanting to take holidays. And of course, ho paid holiday is about people getting rest. And even though we may not be able to go very far, it's important that we take that time um, out and get the rest in order to be able to keep, uh, keep going and to switch off during that holiday period as well. The role of the manager, um, we know that it's really important the managers having continual supportive conversations. Um, at MHFA England, the first question that we ask every time we do a one-to-one -one is how are you and what are you doing to look after yourself? The reason that we ask that question each time um, is so you can try and spot changes. Yeah, so if you were to ask me at a good time, then I would be saying um, doing exercise, walking the dog, um, you know, connecting with friends, etc. But you may well also find that some say, well, actually, I haven't really done anything for a week. And it's not whether I haven't done anything for a week is good or bad or exercising is good or bad. But that, that, that change, you can just say, I hear 
Um, I've heard you say quite different things. Is there anything that I need to you want to talk about or anything I should be worried about? So just a route in to asking the question. But that doesn't just have to be managers, of course. That can also be peers having conversations and, and asking um, you know, amongst peers how people are feeling, what's happening, helps to create those positive habits that generate new ideas. I talked earlier about stepping away from the machine at lunchtime. Um, there are a number of activities which happen um, at lunch, which are organised at exercise classes. We use one called Smash London, which does a, a Wednesday lunchtime exercise class, and we have one, they do one specifically for us on Tuesdays. But just again, trying to make sure that there are things which might mean that you, you decide that you are going to get away from the computer rather than the day just running away from you. Um, and then in terms of peer-led activities, um, you will all know um, and do and have amazing skills outside of your work. You know, what skills could you offer um, into the workspace to help uh, uh, each of you look after your own well-being and um, delivery and creating that space, using the space which organisations are giving um, and, and, and good organisations are doing, giving their teams in order to help you know, promote their well-being within the workspace. And then finally, um, do you know about other sources of support, whether that's mental health first aiders in the workplace, the employee assistance program, Samaritans, you know, lots of parents at work saying they're worried about their children, um, young minds have got a parent's health plan. So how can you either find out about or as managers might you want to um, uh, provide people with that sort of information? Um, and then um, finally, um, just a couple of bits that we've done specifically. Um, so as I said before, December focus was on my whole heart, which is about connectedness and belonging, because we knew that people were feeling um, as though they'd worked hard, they were tired, less connected with their friends. And at the moment, we've got a focus on the whole mind um, and the body, which is about learning something new. Um, and the body really is about trying to um, encourage physical fitness, um, uh, whether that's walking, whether that's running, whether that's uh, uh, just getting outside, looking at nature. So really trying to uh, think about um, how to do that with a view that we want to try and help people find something that works for them, help people connect with each other outside of their immediate teams. Um, and we'll do um, uh, checking in at the end of the month to find out um, the impact of that, specifically on people's mood um, and mental health. But just to give you a very, very clear example of that, and obviously I don't like talking about December uh, in uh, January, almost February, but you know, a whole series of activities which were um, about playlists, about secret centres, around craft and noon, um, connecting um, around ideas that people, the things people are doing. We had a Christmas Bake Off type competition, um, some connect sessions to help people share ideas for presents, etc., and then an organisational quiz. And I think yeah, that can run throughout you know, any time of year. It just happens to have yeah, a Christmas theme to it. And then similarly with the um, uh, my, uh, my mind and body, um, on Mondays we've got meditation and mindfulness weekly challenge, step challenges, which are all things that people do individually. And then just a half hour slot for people to do some uh, art and craft work together. On Tuesdays, a weekly fitness class, an afternoon book club. Wednesdays yoga, walk and talk, Thursday meditation and the radio, and then Fridays a um, weekly afternoon dance um, session. And you know, these are all things which people have volunteers do themselves um, and things which uh, people uh, recognise may be skills that they've got for people. So we as an organisation have really just given people the time to be able to do that. Um, with an expectation, of course, that people that this will help people to um, deliver uh, and and to keep motivated to deliver moving forward. So, hopefully, that was within time. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Simon. I love what you say about connecting, being part of the work. That feels like such an important point to take away, and that idea from from the mind side of it as well about like learning something new, being a big part of how it uh, how you can keep your own resilience and mental health going. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, 
we're going to bring Ingrid and Rian back onto screen now, if that's all right. Um, Simon, I think, can you stay with us a little longer? I know you're a bit tight for time, but yeah. like, thank you. Um, we've had loads of questions come in through Slido, so thank you to everyone that sent them in. Um, please do pop any more on the, that you've got. Um, I'm going to kick off first, uh, Rian, I think, with yourself. So this came in. So why does async seem to be better than synchronous working? Um, and how does that relate to kind of general preferences and communication styles? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I asked to answer this because obviously <laughs> I love this question, but I I love the stuff that uh, that Ingrid said as well. So I love to. I don't want to put you on the spot. We want to hear your answer too. But I the my thought on this is I think we we sometimes conflate how work gets done, how a team is set up with communication style or what I call team interaction modes. Um, and they're they're separate things. So when it comes to preference and communication style, I don't think any of that has a lot to do with synchronous and asynchronous work. That is how work gets done. Um, the thing, the issue I see with synchronous work, even though I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, we use Zoom as well. Um, although I guess we should switch to whereby, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, synchronous work catches everyone at different times of their days or work cycle, depending on where they live, what their role is, and what they were doing right before the meeting. Um, so I think uh, similar to what Sean said, like of the whole self, synchronous kind of almost ignores that because you're forced to all be there at the same time. And if, if I'm at 5 a.m. and someone else is at 2 p.m., it's going to be a different experience. Whereas asynchronous has those the specific benefits for how work gets done, particularly around focus time, because you're able to um, have feedback that is uh, thoughtful, uh, that you've you've uh, you've spent some time doing. And it's I don't want to use the word forced because that's not really what I mean, but it's like you you shouldn't be forced to give your feedback or give your input at a specific time, particularly with how we are all across time zones now. Okay. And then I think that team interaction modes around how we collaborate is kind of a, a, a different topic that isn't really, uh, that, that isn't related to this part. Um, so that would be my answer around how synchronous work forces us to do things a certain way. Before Ingrid, before you jump in, Simon, what's your dog's name? I think. It's Sorry, Dolly. After Dolly Parton. Ah, fantastic, what a beauty. <laughs> Ingrid, I to stop her shouting. By the way, she was just about to start to start singing, so picking her up, stop that. So apologies. I'm Dolly's whole self to this uh, conversation. <laughs> Ingrid, yeah. sorry. No, uh, just to add to that, I think um, async is really also about solving one of the hardest problems as a product manager, which, which is kind of creating an appropriate level of documentation for the work that's being done, the decisions that are being made. And um, the other day, I had one of my PMs uh, draft a really nice Notion page where he had structured the work that they had done as a timeline. And it was just really easy to read and understand why they had, what they had learned, how that, that helped them make the next iteration and so on. And I think especially for us, when we have been scaling, there's new people coming in and they need, to, when they pick up something, they need to understand why was it done in this way. So I think it's also in terms of creating a fabric in the company that lets people build on each other's work and understand why things have been built the way they have. Amazing, lovely, cool, thank you. Um, so, uh, Simon, actually, we had a question in from someone on one of the other uh, other uh, channels. What are some of the signs you've seen when people aren't okay? So you mentioned a couple of things. You know, that being a big important part of why you need to constantly be communicating. Are there any are there any other flags that you've seen which people could look out for? I mean, the most important one is that somebody that you see changes in people, and this is why knowing your team is so important. And it's really easy for people to think about, you know people being low, people being glum, people um, being late, people being untidy. But actually, you know, if somebody normally um, misses deadlines, but suddenly is incredibly punctual and everything's on time, or um, you know, somebody's normally you know, uh, dressed in a particular way and dressed in, in different ways. Or, so it's really about the change. It's about knowing people and being able to spot any changes rather than a set of particular things um, that you would you would see and and so that real but you know the the, the sort of 
uh, low mood, pessimism, uh, lateness, all those sorts of things which people would, would associate with it, but you know, perhaps over worrying. So if you were to know when, uh, yeah, so at the, my, my mum died a few weeks ago and I've been looking after my dad and my partner's not been well. So you know when you've got everything all at once. So what people will say about me at this moment is that for somebody who's normally hands off and trusts people, I'm suddenly worrying over really tiny things and I'm like a Jack Russell. So, you know, it's, and, and actually, some people would be the things which I'm worrying about, some chief execs would worry about all of the time. But it's in that sort of bit. And, and, and so the thing which you can do when you are opening the conversations is ask people. So I would always ask direct reports when they start working for me, when things are not going well, what will I see? You know, and, and how do you want to address that? And so those sorts, of, those are where you sort of bring the conversations in um, all of the time into um, into what's happening. You ask it in advance because most people are pretty clued into you know, what happens. Um, so bring it in, I think, is the really critical critical bit. Amazing. Lovely. Cool. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, uh, so, Ingrid, maybe one for you. I, obviously, growing a company as you have done remotely, you've got a question about any tips on how someone starts a new job well in terms of, you know, understanding the company culture, building relationships, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, and this is a great question. And it made me think of one of the people who joined our team uh, in the spring in the middle of the pandemic. And it was a user researcher who uh, was based in Bali at the time and she couldn't kind of get back. So she was a bit kind of out of time zone with everyone else. So what she did, which I loved, was to make a short uh, loom, like an async video, uh, where she kind of just said, hi, this is me and this is what I am, how I like to work and what I will be doing is whereby and I would love to kind of meet you. So feel free to uh, set up a coffee chat. And then she basically sent that in Slack to all of the people that she um, was going to work closely with. And uh, I think it was a great way um, to get to know her a little bit async, but then also followed up by booking in coffee chats, which is basically just a half an hour where you kind of <laughs> just chat about random stuff. And um, and that kind of lets you enable uh, that relationship from the get-go. Maybe also like to understand the company culture, prepare a couple of questions that you ask people and <laughs> then you'll see how the answers differ and, and can form a picture. I think another great thing that I've done, um, especially for people who are in the little bit like independent roles, is bring them into uh, observed meetings. Like I brought them into our product management meeting, our privacy guy, and so that they see how the different forums work and how people communicate and interact and make decisions, basically. Brilliant. Right, Rin, did you have something to add to that? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> like a big joke. Hey, can you hear me now? Uh, just a couple of things to add there. Uh, I, I love that idea of the asynchronous video. A couple of other things we do is uh, on Basecamp, we use uh, uh, automated check-ins, and they're usually used for work, right? But we use one on Monday morning that asks everyone, how was your weekend? Tell us about your weekend. And people post photos of what they did or didn't do <laughs> these days, what hobbies they took up. Uh, and, and that's just everyone loves those posts. And then there's a tool called Know Your Team um, that we use for uh, for weekly questions. So people submit weekly questions, like if you could meet someone in the past, like, like who would it be, like things like that. And then uh, every new person also gets a set of questions that they answer, just life questions about where they're from and where they grew up and who they, what their pets are um, that gets sent whenever they, they join. So again, those are asynchronous things, but they're a way to create connection that really works well for us. Amazing, lovely, sounds great. Cool, all right, um, lovely. Uh, so top question at the moment in terms of the voting, um, how do you balance the oversharing, fire hosing people with information whilst you know keeping all of those great benefits of transparency that you talked about, Ingrid? Uh, so thanks for that question, Steph. Any thoughts? Yeah, this is a difficult one. So even if we have some thoughts, I'm not sure. I think it's just something you have to work with constantly. Uh, I mean, internal communication is, in my experience as a manager, it's something that I always kind of under uh, value or underestimate how much needs to be invested into that. So I think 
uh, and also because we have been in the scaling mode, we have had to be really, we have to think about it a lot. And um, we have, uh, I think there was a, also a question about these rituals. So we have some sync points where we kind of consciously feed information to people. Like we have um, monthly town halls or um, they might even be bi-weekly now. Um, where we kind of share information that everyone needs to know that's very important. And then we have an announcements channel in Slack, which also everyone is in by default. So, and we've kind of filtered that down to only be very important information. And then um, I guess as we have grown the organization, we have also been relying more and more on the middle managers or the team lead layer to filter information that their team needs to be made aware of to allow the teams to kind of be in their little focus bubble and still be kept in the in the loop on things that are relevant to them sure. um but otherwise i think we also have a very um uh, a people vp who feels strongly about this uh non-parentalism culture that we're not gonna kind of feed spoon feed people with things like if you're interested in something you should kind of seek it out and i think that's where having a really well structured notion or wiki that allows people to find information that they have access to as a, as a good uh, investment. Amazing, Simon. How how have you guys tackled some of that internal comms and you know, communication challenges? It's a perennial issue, isn't it? And I think that you know what's too little for some is too much for others. But I I do think that actually remote working has meant that at least you're on a level playing field in every organisation where you've had some people in the office, some people at home, some people part-time it's felt uneven to people i think probably the best thing um which uh we have done which is actually for our non-execs rather than for the staff but we're thinking about how we implement it internally is um this is what you must read and what you must know and you won't be able to join the conversation if you haven't read and here's a load of information which some of you will be interested in um, and trying to then repurpose the information into different audiences so um, it's again trying to get that right balance, but uh, I think to the point about not being uh, paternalistic or parental, or, or um, it's actually uh, these are these are the places that it is it is available. And if you haven't read it and you're at a disadvantage as a result, that is your responsibility. And, and being able to be really clear um, about about that. But I I mean it always amazes me how the same information can be far too much for some people and nowhere near enough for others. And I think we just have to live with that forever. <laughs> yeah, quite. Everybody. I wanted to add to that. I think one of the things that's really important with, with figuring out the oversharing and who to share with is to have a good decision making framework within teams. Um, we've, we've done a lot of research and they all have these weird acronyms and no one knows how to pronounce them. Like this, the RASCI is one that, or RAC, you know, we settled with one that we decided to, to pronounce Dachi, uh, D-A-C-I. So every product, every project has one driver, one approver, um, it has collaborators and it has people who are informed and that that line between who's a collaborator uh, contributor versus who's informed is really how we should stop the oversharing and fire hosing people because if you're informed you don't need to be in every meeting you don't need to get get involved with every discussion so those lines have become really important for us to to avoid this fire hosing of people yeah. okay um i mean so you slightly mentioned it in your last answer but you know we're moving, we're likely moving back into something of a hybrid model in the UK, maybe, and maybe across the board, probably less so for those running international companies. Um, how, what, what, what are everyone's thoughts on how that'll work out? I think, I think this is going to be a really interesting challenge for us, actually, because uh, one of the things which people like going to the office for is the social side and one of the things which creates satisfaction at work is relationships and not just the relationships in your team but all of the conversations i'm part of is oh well you'll be expected to come on tuesdays for your team meeting and and so it sort of de defies that social benefit of work and the cross-organizational purpose so i think that it is really yeah there's so much to be gained from uh, greater flexibility and going back to the office because when you yeah, remember we will be going back into the office with greater freedoms in the rest of our lives as well so you know, you will get the extra time to go to the swimming pool or to do the things that you you like that the commute may take up 
but I do think we've got to be really careful um, about what the office-based activity um, then becomes so that it doesn't create further silos um, and take away the work satisfaction, employee engagement and motivation, which is ultimately what yeah. drives success within your organization. Yeah, quite. Ingrid. You know, just to add to that, I think there's actually a big danger in this because a lot of companies are going to end up in this hybrid model where some people are in the office and chatting and having meetings in person and deciding things and don't write them down maybe and go back to the, the old ways. And some people are remote and feel completely left out. And then the conclusion will maybe become that, oh, remote working doesn't work. So we want everyone to come back in the office all the time. Um, whereas that's not the real issue, I think. I think it's going to be really important to kind of stick to the routines and tools that you establish when remote. And async is a big part of that. And um, also what we actually did pre-pandemic to put everyone on the same uh, level in terms of access to information and, and so on, is we had this policy that everyone, every day, everywhere, could decide where they wanted to work. So that kind of puts each employee um, in a position where they have control of their own work day and can adapt it to how they work best in their life situation. But for the company, it means we always have to assume that someone is remote. And you have to tra tailor all of the processes and tools to that. Yeah. So um, I think that's maybe a policy that more people should consider, especially because I think a lot of employees have gotten a taste of uh, how great this flexibility can be and how it can reduce their stress, commuting time and so on. So I think it can really be an advantage for companies who choose to do that. And all the benefits it brings for companies, right? You know, the accessibility to talent, the fact that you can hire people across the world, let alone, you know, just five miles from your office. <laughs> I can definitely vouch for that being in Norway. Where oh, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Ryan, anything to follow up on that? Yeah, I think just to add to the, really what, what the others have said, I think it's really important when those office moves go back to consider yourself remote first. So to kind of flip it around, not say we're, we're, we're in the office, how do we make this okay for remote? How do we make this okay for remote people? It's the other way around. We're remote. The offices is an added benefit for some people, and that's okay. So that means when you're on on whereby calls, not Zoom calls, uh, is everyone? Are there five people in a room, and the remote people are each on a screen? No, everyone should be on their screen because you're remote first. Um, so flipping that and saying our baseline is now remote, and yeah, there are some things that the office provide, but it's not, the uh, remote is not the inferior experience. Remote is the baseline for the company. Yeah, brilliant. Excellent. Well, I've, on that, I think that's a great point for us to finish. So thank you so much to our speakers, Rian, Ingrid and Simon. It has been uh, fascinating to hear all of your experiences. Uh, the video will be saved and shared on YouTube afterwards. So if you want to watch it asynchronously or send it to any of your colleagues, then please do. But we'll uh, have another product tank in February and we'll keep you all up to speed about what that's about. But again, thank you very much to all our speakers and thanks for joining. Cheers. Take care. Thank, thank you.